All right, so what you'll find with quite a few of these problems is the statement of the problem is very short. Um, and so the work that we have to do to understand how to get the answer is in the analysis of the situation the problem's describing and the choice of which calculation we need to do to determine the number of ways something can occur or the probability of an event or things like that. So looking at number 10 from our current homework set, it says in a small private school, four students are randomly selected from 13 available students. Then the question is, what is the probability that they are, meaning the, the, the students that are selected, that they are the four youngest students? Questions about this problem? Comments, suggestions, discussion? All right, well, let me outline some of the ideas that are coming to bear in this problem as a sort of a review of chapter four in general and of course, chapter four, section four, which is what this homework is based on. So the first thing is that we want to remember that the idea of a probability of an event, say event A, is in the classical way of calculating a probability is calculated by looking at the number of ways that the event A can occur divided by the number of ways that anything can occur, meaning any possible outcome can occur. And these have to be calculated in equally likely ways so this ends up meaning that this is a problem about counting things. And that's why we have to use our counting techniques. We want to count up the number of ways that we can pick the four youngest students from the group of 13 and divide that by the number of ways that we could pick any four of the students from the group of 13 and make that fraction. So having said that, how do we count up the number of ways of picking students from a group? So the main thing here, we can start by recognizing, well, how many ways can I get the exact four youngest students? There's only one group of students that will be the four youngest students. So the numerator of this fraction, the top of this fraction will be a one. And that one will be out of the number of ways that I could have picked any four students from the 13. So that's really the number we have to calculate here is the denominator. The numerator is going to be a one. So how many different ways can I pick, pick four students from a group of 13? So you may know that calculation, but here were the, the two questions that I mentioned in my introduction before that are at the heart of understanding how to do these problems. So the first thing you want to ask yourself is when you are making choices, are selections repeatable or are they with replacement? So I'm just going to write that as repeatable question mark. And so that shows up as whether when you are making your choices, whether the same thing can be chosen more than once. For example, if I'm choosing letters to spell a word, can I, can I spell the word book where the O was used twice? Or when I use a letter, does it get used up and then I cannot use it again? So repeatable is if it's possible for choices to be repeated and not repeatable or without replacement if once you've used something, you can't choose it again. So in this case, for this problem, we are selecting four students from 13. And since we are choosing a group of four students, I can't choose the same student twice because then I'd only have three students. Or if I just chose the same student four times, I'd only really have one student. It says there will be four students chosen. So that means you only get to choose each one one. Now, for example, if instead, I could be in a very similar situation where maybe I'm choosing 
students from 13 available students to fill four volunteer positions. Like I'm gonna have somebody volunteer to help in the soup kitchen. I'm gonna have somebody volunteer to cut the grass. Well, if I have one student who's just really eager to be very, very helpful, it's possible that I could have one student volunteer to do all four jobs. Certainly maybe one person would do two of them and then two other people will do the other two. But in that kind of a situation, I would be filling four jobs and picking from 13 students, but that could be repeatable choosing because maybe one student could fill more than one of those jobs. So that's an example in a similar circumstances where this would be repeatable. But in this case, since we are picking four of the 13, then the answer to repeatability is no, this is not repeatable. The second question we wanna ask ourselves, well, actually, let me give one more reminder. So why are we choosing about repeatable or not? Well, if it's possible to repeat the same choice, then each time you make that choice, all of the students would be available to you. Every time I'm filling one of those volunteer positions, all 13 students might be chosen. So then by the multiplication rule, I'd have 13 times 13 times 13 times 13, because for each of those choices, all 13 students are available. What happens in a circumstance like this, where it's not repeatable or without replacement, is that then after I've chosen one of the 13, for my second choice, only 12 remains, then after that only 11, and that leads us to one of those factorial calculations, 13 times 12 times 11 counting down. So that's why we wanna think about the repeatability of the choices, because it tells us whether there's a factorial calculation involved or not. All right, so then the second thing to look at is whether order matters. So in 4.4, we discussed this idea of arrangements leading to a straight out factorial calculation. So the number of ways to arrange seven different items from first to seventh is seven factorial. But in that case, order matters. And then we modify that a little bit to go to something called permutations, where you maybe don't choose all seven, but order matters, or combinations when order doesn't matter. And those were slightly different formulas. So whether order matters or not kind of is important to determine which kind of a formula you're using. So in this case, again, what am I doing? I'm just choosing four students from 13. So what do you guys think? Anybody willing to ask a question, discuss, or make a suggestion? Does order matter in this problem? Uh, yeah, because it's the four youngest students. Okay, so I've got a yes and I have a no. I have a no that was chatted to me and a yes that was verbalized. So that means this is a great idea for discussion. Okay, so what are we counting? We have to think about the different ways of picking four students. So let's focus on the idea of the youngest students. Let's say the youngest four students were 17, 18, 19, and 20 years old, and everybody else was different ages. So I'm picking four students. If I choose the I, if I choose the youngest students in that order, 17, 18, 19, and then 20, I pick the 17-year-old first, then the 18-year-old, then the 19-year-old, then the 20-year-old, then I would definitely have the four youngest students, right? But what if I picked those students in a different order? What if I picked the 20-year-old, then the 19-year-old, then the 18-year-old, then the 17-year-old? Would those still be the four youngest students? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and does the order that I picked them matter? No. It does not. It does not. So we have to be, we have to really be thoughtful about the structure of what's being described here. That's the hard part of these problems is that you might see a word that makes you want to draw a conclusion quickly. That's very easy to do, but it can be misleading. Sometimes it'll work. 
So why would the order possibly matter when I pick the four? Well, in my earlier discussion, if I had four different volunteer positions, well then which student goes to which position will cause the order to matter? Did the 19 year old get the, the uh, soup kitchen volunteer position or did the 19 year old get the um, grass cutting volunteer position? So then it's not only which four students did I chose, but which of those students is doing which of those volunteer jobs. Or the simplest example is if you think of, I had 13 students run a race and who were the first four finishers? Who came in first, second, third, and fourth? Well, there's a difference when you came in first or fourth. So the order of which of those four you were in then order matters when you're ranking the top four finishers or something like that. But in this case, you are just choosing four as a group and which people are in the group is what matters, not the order in which those four in the group were chosen. So in this case, order matters, the answer is no. Questions, comments, discussions about that? So I'm trying to sort of go slowly and carefully through the analysis and discuss the ideas and the things that you have to consider because they apply to most of the problems uh, in this section. Okay, so if I put these two things together, order does not matter and um, there's not replacement, it's not repeatable, then that leads us to combinations. Combinations, if, if order matter, that would be permutations. But this is a combination, this is a combo. And so there's a formula for that. How many ways can I pick 14 out of a group of 13 when order does not matter? We write that as 13 choose four. And there was a formula for that. The formula is you take the, the large number 13 factorial in the top of the fraction and you divide it by 13 minus four, which is nine factorial times four factorial. Again, there's a little formula. I'm just plugging into it, but you can look it up in the slideshow or in the, uh, in the PowerPoint slides or in the textbook. And then this I can type directly on a calculator or I could simplify this with the factorials a little bit. So let's say I just show you what that looks like if you're having a hard time finding a calculator with a factorial button. So when you have a factorial in the top and the bottom of a fraction, you can cancel out part of the bigger one in the top by one of the smaller ones in the bottom. So for example, 13 factorial would be 13 times 12 times 11 times 10, and then I would go nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, like that. But then all that other stuff after that is nine factorial. So I'm pulling off the first four numbers that are multiplied together and leaving the other nine numbers as just their nine factorial, because then I can recognize that's the same as the nine factorial in the bottom. And the reason that's helpful is that those in a fraction would then cancel out. So in the bottom, I actually have four times three times two times one. I don't have to write the times one. And now I can simplify the fraction even further. Four times three is 12. So that cancels with the 12 in the top. Two goes into 10 five times. So I'm just left on the top with 13 times 11 times five. And that's going to be my total for how many different ways I can pick four students out of 13. So I'm gonna pull up a little calculator here. Now this calculator in Windows, and you're welcome to use that as well, has a factorial button. So I could have just, I could have just typed in this original fraction here with the factorials over here using the factorial button. But now that I've gotten it all the way down so that it's just this product, I'll go 13 times 11 times five. And I get 715. So that means that in my original fraction, 715 is the number of ways that I can make any choice of four students from 13, um, from 14, I mean, oh yeah, 13. And that there's one way 
that I would happen to get all of the youngest students. That can happen with only one of those groups will happen to have the four youngest students. And so that that then becomes the answer to my problem here. It says, what is the probability that you get the four youngest students and they want an integer or a simplified fraction. So my fraction will be one over 715. And that's my probability. Questions about any part of that? Yeah, um, why did you scratch off the four and two and 12 and 10? I was caught up all the way up to there, that point. Okay. So if I have a fraction, like I'm gonna say um, 10 over 15, notice that the problem says type an integer or simplified fraction, right? So I could multiply these numbers all together and get two big numbers. But the idea is the way you simplify a fraction is you look at the factors in the fraction. So for example, 10 over 13, is five times two over five times three. And the way you simplify a fraction is you see when there's the same factor in the top and the bottom. For example, five divided by five is one. So these just, if I do that, I just get a one here and this simplifies to two thirds. So the nine factorial in the top and the bottom, whatever that big number is, it's the same number in the top and the bottom so I just cancel it out. And then what is four times three? That's 12. So I crossed out the four and the three and the 12 because four times three is 12 and that's 12 in the top and the bottom. And 10 factors as five times two. So I crossed out the two dividing it into the 10, just leaving the five. So I had a five left, an 11 left and a 13 left. Does that make sense or do I need to explain that better? How do you feel about that, sir? And that actually makes sense. That was a good way of explaining it. And also keep in mind, I think it's good to do this just to try to refresh your sense of some fraction manipulations, but I could have entered over here 13 factorial, just saw what that number was, nine factorial times four factorial, just on my calculator over here, and then just done division over here and I would have got 715 as well. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Okay. That's a simpler way. Yeah. Why well, don't I just show you? Okay. So I could go over here. And I could go 13 factorial. Look at that big number. We're locked to like 6 billion there. And go divided by 9 factorial equals. And then also divide that answer by 4 factorial. And I get 715, which is what we just got. Okay. That makes sense. I like that. So yes, yeah, so I, I wanted to illustrate a little bit because sometimes people do end up on the test and don't have a sense of how to get to a calculator with a factorial button on it, or even have a handheld calculator they like to use and don't know where the factorial button is, or maybe there even isn't one on a really cheap one or something. Usually even a $10 Walgreens scientific calculator will have a factorial button on there somewhere. But you don't even need to use it, but if you do, it does make this a little quicker and smoother. So good question. Other questions about any part of this that I should explain better or elaborate on? Okay, so let's clear that. And I'm gonna do uh, the next one a little bit quickly because I wanna leave time to hop over to a problem later that was asked about 21. But let's take a look at the next problem because it's very similar. A moving company has a truck filled for deliveries to six different sites. If the order of the deliveries is randomly selected, what is the probability that it is the shortest route? So again, we're gonna have a probability. And if uh, I'm picking things, what am I picking? I'm picking a route. I'm picking a order in which I'm going to go to these six sites and give deliveries. So I ask my same two questions. Are these selections repeatable? And does order matter? So what do you guys think? When I'm picking sites to go to for deliveries, 
Can I visit the same site twice? Is it okay to repeat the sites that I'm going to for deliveries? I don't think so. I would think that if a company is making deliveries and they have six places to go to, why would they go to the same place twice? <laughs> they go there, they make their deliveries, and then they go to the next one on the list, right? Yeah, but yeah. Well, I, I want you to think about it because when you're doing these your problems yourself, you're just going to have to be able to answer these questions correctly in order to choose the right calculations. And that is the rub. These are word problems. So you have to understand what's going on well enough to do that. Now, does the order that I do go to these places matter? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to all six. So the only difference is which order do I go? And particularly, we're trying to, it says, if the order of the deliveries is randomly selected, that means the order is being chosen, not just which sites. We know which sites. So it's not like we're picking six places to go to out of 100. We're only going to six. And the only question is the order in which we go to them. The shortest route would be a particular trip, a particular order to make on my deliveries that is as short as possible. So order matters. In this case, the answer was yes. For the last problem, it was no. So if it's not repeatable, that means factorials. And if order matters, that means these are permutations. Permutations for position and combinations for uh, is for like committees. Okay, so uh, how many different ways uh, are there to order the six different sites that I'm going to deliver to? Well, that's an example of arrangements. So that's immediately six factorial. You could also write that is six permute six, and the formula will end up being six factorial. But it's just since you're going to all of them, it's just how many different ways can I arrange six things in a root, and that's six factorial. And there's one of those that will be the shortest possible route. And so that's my calculation. So what is six factorial if I do it on the calculator? It's 720. So this would be one out of 720. Questions about that? So thing to take note of, this was very similar to the very previous problem, number 10, and now we're looking at number 11. But on 10, we used a combination calculation, and on 11, we used a permutation calculation. And we had to be able to recognize from the description of the problem which one to use. Um, is it a different um, like process if repeatable is yes and order is no? Yeah, uh, so uh, if it's repeatable, then you're using the same number every time instead of counting down so you don't have a factorial. And then if order doesn't matter, you need to divide by how many things the ordering was counting. So for example, if I was to choose five things out of 10, then I would do 10 to the fifth because there's uh, sort of 10, 10 times 10 times 10 different ways, then if order does not matter in terms of which of those I picked in which order, then I have to divide that out by, I think it would just be five factorial. I don't think you, that's a little bit more complicated. I don't think you'll get that exact combination. I don't think you'll get repeatable where order doesn't matter. I think you'll only get repeatable where order matters. And then you would just have one out of 10 to the fifth. And we had an example like that in the slides where it was the different number of four number combo locks. And in a combination, you can have seven, 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 seven. And so that's repeatable, yes. And then it's just, it was like one over 10 to the fourth as an example. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so let's try jumping over to number 20 and see if I can do 20 and 21 in our dozen minutes that remain here. Let me look at what 21 is because this could take the whole time. Let me, I don't want to do 21 because somebody asked about that. Okay, so 21, um, 
is not going to use any formula. So one of the students asked about that in particular. So uh, I, I think I'll do this. Um, I did uh, number 20 in my earlier class. So I'll look at number 21 now. And even though I think I did 10 and 11 in both of them, I'll just go ahead and post them both. And that way you can at least see 20 and 21. At least there'll be some difference between the two. Or yeah, I'll think about it. I'll definitely do 21 now and I might not post, uh, post the earlier one. We'll see. Okay, how many different ways can you make change for a quarter? Well, this is a problem where it's really just about organization and counting techniques. Uh, this will not be a formula problem. And so this problem, the, the homework is really testing if you understood the organization of how to count things up. And one of the organizational methods that's demonstrated in the textbook is this idea of a branching tree. That helps, the branching tree helps understand the multiplication rule, and that's why it's demonstrated. But sometimes it's used even when you can't just multiply things together. And so I think that's how this would be done. So let me just illustrate the idea of how this would be done, see if there are questions, and if I have time to go to the previous one, I will. All right, so if I'm making change for a quarter, I have a succession of decisions to make. And so I have to think about those decisions, like how many dimes, how many nickels, and how many pennies. Those are the only coins that I can use, right? And each different combinations of those coins would be a different way to make change. So a simple example, it could be five nickels, that would be one way, or it could be 25 pennies, that's another way, or there could be some dimes involved, et cetera. So imagine that I'm gonna take my 25 cents and I'm gonna split it up. And so I'm gonna go through those succession of decisions with a branching tree as a way to organize counting up the different ways to do something. So the first decision I'm gonna make is how many dimes, cause that's the biggest coin and that uses up the most money once I decide that. Now, how many dimes can I give? Well, if I'm changing a quarter, I have three possibilities, either zero, one, or two. So I'm going to branch off in this tree and say for the dimes that I did zero, one, or two. Then the idea behind the tree branching method is that in each of those choices, I say, well, once I've made that decision, how many other ways can I make the following decisions? So I'll start with the two. If I'm giving two dimes, then the next question would be how many nickels? And if I gave two dimes, then there's only two possibilities for the nickels. There can be either zero or one. And once I've given the number of dimes and the number of nickels, then whatever's left has to be given in pennies. So I could think about the number of pennies, but the truth is there won't be a choice for how many pennies I give once I've chosen dimes and nickels because I just have to give the rest of the money in pennies. For example, if I, if I take the, uh, the pathway here, most on the right, where I'm giving two dimes and one nickel, well, then I have to give no pennies because I've already given 25 cents. If I take the pathway of two dimes and no nickels, then I'm up to 20 cents and there has to be five pennies. So I can write these down here, no pennies, five pennies, but it's clear that I don't get additional methods. And so this overall path of my quarter from here to here is path number one. This overall path to get my quarter changed here is path number two. Then I would do the same thing for if I gave one dime or no dimes. I would give the different number of ways to nickels and then the pennies are determined and I count those up and each one of those will be the total, um, we'll, we'll count up the ways to give change. So just to go one more step further and then I'll leave the rest to you. If I give one dime, then how many nickels can I give? Zero, one, two, or three. So if I give, I didn't do my branching. If I give one dime, then I can go zero, one, two, or three nickels. And then in each one of those cases, whatever's left will be pennies. And then I could say if there are zero dimes given, then I can give anywhere from 
zero through five nickels. And each one will correspond. And I just add up how many of those are, and that's the different number of ways that I can do it. It sounds pretty good. Um, I feel like it's gonna be different when I try it on my own. I don't think this problem will be any different. I think this is the same for everybody, but it could be that you get a similar problem because this is your number 21 and there's no way to change the numbers on this problem, but there could be a similar problem elsewhere in the assignment. I haven't looked through it completely recently, or there could be a similar problem that's not on the assignment that shows up on a test, either a quiz or the midterm, because usually about half of the problems are on your homework and problems are randomly chosen from those for the quiz in the midterm. So it's just about recognizing that this is more of a unique situation where you just have to organize it in some way. All right, I'm gonna take a stab at just going over and covering the previous problem so we can get it all on one video for me to post, even if it'll be a little rushed. So let's take a look at number 20. And that was where you are trying to find out the probability of being dealt a blackjack. So there's a description of what it means to get a blackjack hand. You get two cards from a deck of 52. And to get a blackjack, blackjack you need one of four aces and one of 16 other cards that are worth 10 points, tens or face cards. And it says for you, the two cards can be in any order, find the probability of being dealt a blackjack. I got five minutes. So be a little rushed, but we can do it. So again, remember, we want the probability of getting a blackjack. And that's the number of ways to get a blackjack divided by the number of ways to get any two cards, because it's a two card hand, you're being dealt two cards. Now, it says specifically order doesn't matter, just telling you when you get the ace and the 10 pointer, it doesn't matter if you got the ace first and then the king or the king first and then the ace, as long as you get those two. So right away, that's telling you order does not matter. And of course, this is also not repeatable because I can't get two ace of spades. Each card only shows up in the 52 cards in the deck once and you can't get dealt the same card twice. So what does that mean? that we have, whoops, just wrote the wrong one. Order doesn't matter and it's not repeatable. So this is an example of combinations. So how many ways can I get a blackjack? Well, I have two things that need to be chosen. One of the four aces and one of the 16 other 10 point cards. And so I have two different things going on by the multiplication rule the number of ways that both of those can happen is the product of the number of ways that those can individually happen. So imagine I'm choosing my first card and I'm choosing my second card. The order doesn't matter. So how many ways can I get an ace? Four, because there's four of them. How many ways can I get a 10 point card? 16. It's like the combination lock. I have to dial the first position, then the second position. I have to deal the first card, then the second card. The order doesn't matter, but there's four ways to get an ace and 16 ways to get the 10 pointer. So that's the number of ways to get a, the blackjack when dealt two cards where one's an ace and one's a 10 pointer and order doesn't matter. Now I would divide that by the number of ways that I can be dealt any two cards, order doesn't matter. So that's a combination. So I would just do 52 choose two, and that'll give me my probability. So if I do that over here, I'm gonna go uh, 50, uh, well, I'll, I'll write the formula for 52, choose two, just to remind folks. So that's 52 factorial, 52 minus two would be 50 factorial and two factorial. I could type all those factorials in the calculator, but this one's going to simplify really nicely because if I'm counting out 52 factorial, I go 52 times 51, and then after that, it's 50 and below, which is what the bottom factorial is. So I basically can write on the top 52 times 51 and then just cancel out the factorial on the bottom. So I have 52 times 51 over two factorial, which is two. Two goes into 52, 26 times. So that's 26 times 51. 
that's 52 choose two. So on my fraction, I have four times 16 in the top and I have 26 times 51 in the bottom. That is my probability, the number of ways to get a blackjack div divided by the number of ways to get any two cards. I need to simplify my fraction as the problem always reminds me. And the only simplification here I can see is that the top and the bottom both have two as a factor. So I would divide 26 by two giving me 13 and I would divide four by two giving me two. So what I end up with on the top is two times 16, which is 32. And in the bottom I have 13 times 51, which I don't know what that is. That is, oops, I did 513. So let's clear. 13 times 51. That is 663. So after I've simplified the fraction of how many ways to get a blackjack divided by how many ways to get any two cards, I end up with 32 divided by 663. Um, we're about out of time. It does then ask for the probability uh, as a percentage. So that would just mean taking that fraction and getting the decimal and converting it to a percentage. So 32 divided by 663 as a fraction to a decimal is that. If I move the decimal over two places, I get 4.83 when I round off to two point places. So I get 4.83. That's the percent chance that you're going to get dealt with blackjack.